the brokenness within our own church as our denomination fractures. We pray for peace. We pray for hope. And we pray remembering that throughout the ages, while things have changed and shifted and people have been harmed, you remain the same. And you are our strength to carry on. And you are our power to speak life into death and light into darkness. So for all of these things, we ask for your help. And for all of our blessings, we say thank you. But we thank you mostly for Jesus, who showed us what it means to live and love even when life is unjust, what it looks like to stand in the margins with those who need a, a voice, a touch, or a moment of hope, and what it's like to lay down your life for the least and the last and the lost. Give us eyes like Jesus to see the needs and hearts like he had to love them. And now hear us as we sing the words that he taught his disciples, the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. 
ball games at the school across the street, or the 4th of July fireworks on the college hill across town. We weren't really that high up. I've been back as an adult and that tree is not as big as I remember it. But when I was a child of tree climbing age, it was quite the tree. Scripture tells us of another who climbed a tree to gain a higher vantage point. When I was a key kid of that tree climbing age, we used to sing that old Sunday school song, if you remember it. Now the song goes, Zacchaeus, the wee little man, climbed the, tr the tree for the Lord he wanted to see. But I remember that song being that Jesus said, come down because I'm coming to your house for tea. It doesn't actually say that in any version I've found since, but when I sing it to the kids, I remind them that even Jesus drank tea. <laughs> Zacchaeus' story is interesting, even as a child Sunday school story, but when you put it into the context of Luke's narrative, it becomes a fascinating story about justice. At this point in Luke's gospel, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover and to begin his journey towards the cross. Luke 19 tells us that he had finally entered Jericho. Jericho was a city 20 miles east of Jerusalem. And before that, in Luke 18, 18 to 30, Jesus confronted a rich ruler who had said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? After a brief conversation about keeping the commandments, Jesus said to the man, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. Then come and follow me. Now in that story, the rich ruler refused to do so, and thus he went away very sad. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, a very wealthy man, vows to give half of all of his possessions to the poor. Now even though it had a sordid past, by the time Jesus got to the city, Jericho had become a wealthy city on the outskirts of Jerusalem. The roads to and from Jericho were dangerous, but the city itself was a thriving commercial center. It was also the home of this wealthy tax collector named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' name is quite interesting, given the flow of Luke in the storytelling. His name means pure or innocent, which is rather ironic because we learn from this snippet of story that he is neither pure nor innocent. But perhaps at this point, he just hasn't lived into his name yet. Jericho was strategically located east of Jerusalem, near the Jordan River. So it was a major stop on the trade routes between Jerusalem and Judea and other cities. The city was known for its fine buildings, its wide streets and public squares, and its luxurious buildings and homes. And as a major commercial center, it was also the home to customs, and taxes. Tax collectors were known for their dishonesty and thievery. None of us really like the IRS, but at least we know that they're going off of a very complicated sense of um, black and white tax codes. But it wasn't the case in Jesus' time. Tax collectors had one job, get money to pay it to the Romans who were in charge. How they came about that, or how much they charged, were up to the tax collectors. The entire tax system in the Roman Empire was corrupt. No one liked paying taxes then any more than we do now, but they were even especially hated because they were Jewish people who were taking advantage of other Jews to get wealthy at the expense of their friends and neighbors to make the system of government that was so oppressive even more able to oppress. They were seen as traitors by their fellow Jews. They had sold out their heritage in order to be partners with this oppressive government. And they were so despised by fellow Jewish people that they were not even allowed to enter the temple. Zacchaeus wasn't just a tax collector, in fact, but he was the chief. The chief tax collector in the area was responsible for all of the other tax collectors. And as a result of corruption, chief tax collectors like Zacchaeus were the wealthiest of the wealthy people in town. But Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus, and he wanted to see him. And he was, as my mom always tells me, she's not short, she's just vertically challenged. Zacchaeus was vertically challenged. So, like my brother and I did when we were kids, 
in front of a tree. Now there's no evidence in the text that Zacchaeus wanted to talk to Jesus. We've seen stories throughout scripture of people pressing through the crowds to touch or see Jesus. But that didn't happen in this case. He just wanted to see him. So he climbed the tree, and I imagine he was as surprised as everyone else when Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to your house. I'm going to be your guest. We're going to drink some tea. The sudden stop was unexpected. There is no evidence that Jesus even planned to stay in Jericho. Nobody planned to stay in Jericho. It was Passover time. The destination was Jerusalem. Even Luke said Jesus was just passing through. Also, it was against all cultural norms for anyone, even a rabbi, even Jesus, to invite himself to somebody else's house. Whatever the reason, Zacchaeus was not looking to meet Jesus. Jesus certainly was looking to meet Zacchaeus. And that's a great moment in this story in and of itself. Jesus is the one who initiates the relationship with Zacchaeus. It's a beautiful thought. God pursues us as much as we pursue God. And this is actually unique in our faith. In other religions, it's the follower's responsibility to reach out to the divine. But we read about a God who also reaches out to us. My first job out of seminary was the director of education, Christian education at Muskegon United Methodist Church. And right across the street was the Church of God in Christ, which was the black church, we were the white church, and occasionally we would do things together. And this particular summer we did vacation Bible school together, and so I would attend their three-hour church services during vacation Bible school season. And the preacher talked once of a God who never let go. Behind him on the wall was a huge painting of a human hand reaching up as far as it could, but it could only go so far. And through the clouds came God's hand reaching the rest of the way to clutch that human being's hand. I was struck by that imagery that we can only reach so far, no matter how hard we try, but God is able to bridge the gap between us. In fact, that was the point of Jesus to bridge the gap. Zacchaeus' experience is a good reminder of that, that even if we stop seeking, or even if our seeking falls short, we are pursued. God seeks us. So Jesus went to visit Zacchaeus. It doesn't matter what the others thought about Zacchaeus. Jesus had hoped for him. Zacchaeus scrambled down from the tree, and people grumbled, but Jesus was not deterred. People said that it was not the right thing to do, but Jesus did it anyway. He went to the tax collector's house, he had lunch and maybe tea, and many lives were transformed as a result. The story of Zacchaeus is a story of reconciliation, which is the first step in restorative justice. Restorative justice is about wholeness for victims and wrongdoers. It have, in my middle school classes, taught a book called Touching Spirit Bear. It's a story of a young man who gets into some serious trouble in Minneapolis and is facing a jail sentence at 15 for beating up another boy. And a Native American from Alaska said, let's try circle justice. And he told the story like this. He said, if you kill my cat and then you're punished and go to jail, you're in prison, I'm sad, and my cat is still dead. But if instead you have to come and help me pick out a new cat, and you have to help me raise that cat and take care of it, and we have to talk about the pain that caused you to do what you did and the pain that you've left me in, maybe there's a chance for healing, for wholeness, for restoration. It's different from how we think about justice in our criminal justice system, which is often about retribution. You did this, and so you must pay. God's kind of justice is different. It's about healing, fairness, equity, and love. Jesus chose Zacchaeus and stayed at his house because he had desired for him to be reconciled with God and people. It was the way to save the life and save the community. And more importantly, the story shows us that God to human reconciliation is very much linked to human, human reconciliation. 
The Pledge of Zacchaeus is all the more shocking because of its stark contrast with the story of that rich ruler. Zacchaeus freely volunteered his acts of charity and reparation after meeting with Jesus. The story strongly suggests that once somebody, anyone, has the love of money and it's gotten in the way of loving others, or someone who's guilty of crime, <coughs> or anyone who has found themselves in a distance, is hope, there is hope for reconciliation. I wonder what caused Zacchaeus to make such a radical choice. Why did the rich ruler, religious and well-trained in the law, resist reconciliation, while Zacchaeus, an outcast and a sinner, embraced it? What was different about the two of them? I imagine if Jesus had first said to Zacchaeus, first you must keep the commandments, that in itself would have been a shock because there's so many commandments he hasn't kept. But the rich ruler was smug in his understanding of the commandments because he knew what they were and he had kept them. I think the answer is found in Zacchaeus' experience of the costly grace of God shown by Jesus. Zacchaeus saw the risk that Jesus took in choosing him. Jesus was already being accused of being a friend to sinners, and Jesus' decision to stay with Zacchaeus alienates him even further from the community. It wasn't the easy choice. Even his disciples began to grumble because Jesus was going to be the guest of a well-known sinner. Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, was intentionally breaking social norms to connect with and associate with Zacchaeus, and there would be repercussions. And these were people who have already begun to see what the repercussions might be and fear for their own lives. Zacchaeus' pledge to make reparations was not motivated by legalism or a desire for personal gain, but simply by God's grace. Zacchaeus was motivated to reconcile with his neighbors and victims, too, because the encounter that he had with God through the compassion of Jesus Christ changed him. This is evident in Zacchaeus' decision to give half of his wealth to the poor and to compensate four times what he owed the victims of his deceit, which was way more than was required by the Jewish law. Reconciliation between humans is no easy task. It's hard to reconcile with somebody you've hurt, and even harder to be reconciled with somebody who has hurt you. It's hard for us systemically to reconcile with groups of people who have systemically hurt other groups of people. I wonder what happened to Zacchaeus as a result. How did his wife or his children relate to this decision? What was it like for him to come face to face with the victims that he had exploited? What might have become, um, I wonder if he would have become hopeless, if he had lost family members. I wonder if he encountered some who said reparation is not sufficient. You ruined my life. To confront the hardship and suffering of people would have been personally shameful and heartbreaking to Zacchaeus. He more than likely experienced hostility, but he did it. The actual business of disentangling of his web of past financial abuses and economic oppression would have been far more challenging than simply making and keeping his promise. Also, Zacchaeus would more than likely have found continuing his position as a tax collector impossible. And so how would this man have continued the life that he led? The point of all of this is to say reconciliation is costly. It's difficult. But it's the point of the gospel. That's why Jesus came. And it's the first step in reconciling ourselves to God. Especially when the harm is systemic and deeply embedded in our life practices, we find that simply saying, I'm sorry, is not enough. Reparations must be made. Broken systems must be toppled. Those in power must abdicate so those without power can be elevated. It's not just a change of heart. It requires deep internal work and great external consequences. This past year, our bishop has put forth some priorities for the United Methodist Church, and one of those has been radical disengagement and dismantling of racism. But dismantling racism is hard work. It's not simply saying, I'm not racist. It's recognizing the racist actions we've each taken in our own lives and looking at how systemically our actions 
as a community have left people broken and harmed. What can we learn from Zacchaeus' story for our own tasks of dismantling racism and other kinds of reconciliation? I think we start by reminding ourselves that Zacchaeus' act of reconciliation was a response to God's reconciliation. The power of divine grace is far stronger than the power of divine guilt. Forgiveness and grace, though invisible, are transformative. It sets a new motion in our hearts. Once it enters into our heart, it convicts and compels and convinces us away from fear and anxiety and shame towards the hope of new relationships and fresh starts. The other thing we learn from Zacchaeus is that our greatest concern must not be for the status quo, but for the margins. Before he encountered Jesus, Zacchaeus enjoyed greater status in the occupied Roman culture, and he was able to accommodate it. The Jericho house today, known as the House of Zacchaeus, is a large, opulent tower. But Zacchaeus used his neighbor's money to buy status in Rome which caused his own people to reject and sideline him. Jesus' pursuit of Zacchaeus illustrates the upside-down nature of his kingdom. Up in the tree, Zacchaeus might have been easy for those with Jesus to miss. But it's here in the story that Jesus looked up. We learn from this that Jesus has been paying active attention, seeking, looking, when Zacchaeus climbs down, he becomes a real-life lost sheep rescued, a lost coin found, a lost son returned home. He's a real-life part of the parables Jesus has been telling. Just like practicing reconciliation and restoration allow us to reenact Zacchaeus' story, so do we embrace Jesus' mission when we look past the distractions of our own lives to those on the sidelines, to the outliers, to the oppressed. How often have we flowed through being a part of dominant culture without looking to the side to see those who are injured by our choices and our very existence as the dominant culture? How often do we walk by a person who lives on the streets and not see them? How often do we walk by somebody without asking their story or appreciating where they've been? It's tempting to see ourselves among those with Jesus. But we must take care to not be one of the crowd, the ones obscuring justice or withholding grace from those who are desperate for it. Paying attention to our place in the story is important because it reminds us that we too need to see Jesus and that we too need to invite those on the margins to be a part of our journey, this journey of justice and reconciliation and love. And that sometimes a part of that reconciliation journey is to get out of the way and let those who have been sidelined lead the way. So who are we in the story? Are we the crowd taunting those who speak out on behalf of others, those who would seek to make amends and reconcile? Are we the ones preventing justice and grace from happening? Or are we like Jesus, looking up, looking around, working towards radical hospitality? and restorative justice. Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. That amazing promise will always live in us as we engage in the ministry of reconciliation. Jesus didn't make peace with the sword. He made it through relationship, and primarily with relationship for those on the margins those who have been deeply harmed by systemic injustice. We are to be God's witnesses in this world, a world that is hungry for grace, thirsty for friendship, and beyond ready for God's restorative way of doing justice. May we engage our hearts and our hands to do this work in our world, our community, and even our own church. Amen. Let's stand together for our hand of response. The PS was a tax.